founders, what's going on. You guys know I love in-person events and they are back. The recording you're about to hear is from our most recent event where we had hundreds of founders come together, share intimate details, templates, KPIs, OKRs about their business. And it was something special, something special. We'd love to meet you in person. If you want to see the next live events we have coming up via our schedule, the link will be down below in the description. If you're listening on iTunes, check this out on YouTube. You'll see the links in the description, or you can just Google Founder Path or Latka next event. We'd love to see you in person. In the meantime, though, enjoy this recording. It's a good one. Hundreds of software millionaires are created every week. Will our founder today get a multi-million dollar check in the next 15 minutes? You're watching Deal or Bust, and I'm your host, Nathan Latka. Over the past five years, I've helped founders do over a billion dollars in deals after I sold my first company in 2015. I detailed all of it in my best-selling business book, How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital, which has sold 30,000 copies. Our podcast has been downloaded over 12 million times, making it the most listened to business show in the world. Latka Magazine is five times the price of Forbes and shipped to over 10,000 subscribers every single month. So the question is, will our founder today get a multi-million dollar check in the next 15 minutes? All right, guys, I have no idea how this is gonna pan out. We don't plan this. Um, we watch Shark Tank and we go, we should do this for SaaS. That was the email in my inbox like a year or two ago. They're like, Nathan, you should try Shark Tank for SaaS. So that's exactly what we're gonna do over the next, I don't know how long it's gonna go because you're gonna meet the founder. The founder's gonna present P&L, balance sheet. We've got updated data through January. So full January 2022 profit and loss statement. You'll learn about his product, his product strategy, go to market, team a little bit. I'll then introduce three of the sharks on stage who will sit here with the founder in the last chair. And the investors will, just like Shark Tank, effectively ask questions to the founder. Uh, the founder, when they come on stage, will effectively ask how much equity they're looking to sell and for how much capital. And uh, we'll see if a deal gets done. All that matters is that I get 10% of whatever happens. Uh, so I don't really care what happens. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it should be a ton of fun. The point of this is to make it very entertaining, a lot of fun. I've told both sides to be very tough on the other. So you know, we'll, we'll sort of see what happens. Um, with all that being said, I have no idea uh, where the clicker is. Um, so we'll get a clicker up here in a second. Um, who's watched Dealer Bus, the YouTube versions? Has anyone, anyone seen the old ones? A couple? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Did you like them? Just yell it out. Was it, Jonathan, was it fun? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're interesting. We did, tw we recorded 20 episodes on YouTube and people always go, did, it, did deals close? Like what happened? So I'll just, I'll, I'll bear the truth. I'll lay it all out. We had uh, about 15 verbal offers agreed to on the show and only five of them closed, right? So the, they basically took it off after the recording. Five of them actually closed. It took many months, but they closed. So that was, that was kind of fun. Um, so with that being said, I'll let you guys sort of study this for a second. I'm gonna stop talking. You can sort of look at this. What I would encourage you to do is look at this P&L and think about how you would value this business, okay? Think about how you would value this business. Are those numbers big? Can you guys see those numbers? They're too small. Hmm. Well, take a picture on your phone and zoom in on your phone. <laughs> hey, my photography crew, take a picture now. All the cameras up. I look like a celebrity. Where's my Where's my camera guy? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. See if that will work, especially our sharks. Um. We'll sort of just sort of figure this out as we go along, right? So that's that's sort of the story, or that's the that's the PL to date. Um, you guys ready to meet the founder? The founder has to be so vulnerable to do this, by the way, right? I mean, you're you're spilling your guts out. I'm like, you can't do this unless you put your full PL from January. Like, what are you talking about, Nathan? It's like everything. I'm like, you gotta do it. You gotta do it or it's not gonna work. So our founder today, very excited. Uh, he, this is a guy I've known for a while. He spoke at my last event in Austin, Texas, and the strategies he taught was effectively how to place like 10,000 calls per month with this sort of call strategy he used. He hired call reps off of Craigslist, taught them to close deals, and that is his main go-to-market strategy for his company, and it's done extremely well. Again, bootstrapped founder. Uh, I'm not gonna spoil anything else. Guys, please welcome Andre with Referizer to the stage. Andre, come on up, man. <laughs> All right, my man, this is going to be your mic. All right, this is going to be your mic. So you take it away. Take everyone through these first couple of slides. Explain what you're up to. 
First, uh, thank you, Nathan. Uh, can we give a huge round of applause for Nathan? I'm not helping you get so, a better deal here. <laughs> okay, I see my screen's here. So my name is Andre, I'm a founder. I bootstrapped company for eight years. I didn't want to raise the money or couldn't raise the money. Let's put one of these two, right? So what we are doing is we designed the world most advanced marketing automation for local businesses. There's pretty much no company that offers as many features as we do for in one platform. Full transparency, we're the company who have transparent data across the company, but also with Nathan, and he asked for the data. So we went from nothing 2015 to uh, $3 million annual revenue now. And PL that he was showing was our PL. So 86% gross margin. We're burning about, about 40,000 a month. But almost $3 million last quarter is 250,000 per month. Wait, wait, and say that again. 3 million lost? What do you no, mean? No, we have $3 million annual you revenue now when it, when it comes to uh, multiply last quarter times four. And we are very cash positive. Like thanks to COVID and the stress of not knowing what's gonna happen, we decide to fill up our cash bank. So we are now on $775,000 in cash in hand and we're still growing. So before you go, sharks go back, you should take a picture of this on your phone as well. Sharks, go back to the balance sheet. Hold on. Uh, hit the back. red button on your clicker. Got it. Yeah, let everyone take a shot of this. So yep. that they can zoom in. Are there any big expenses you want to point out that are not normal? What I want to point is software development cost. I know, sorry. Software <laughs> development costs. You spent almost seven hundred thousand bucks on software development costs last year. I know, and think about that. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars only. Okay, it, wait, is that a surprise or not? It's a SaaS uh, company. I mean, that's not SaaS bad for a three company. million AR company. And this is paying people fifteen dollars an hour in Serbia, right? If I was about to hire the same people in the US, it would be probably four times that number. So we are very proud of that number. That's the reason why we are most advanced platform. That's the reason why we have more apps and features than anybody else. That's the reason why we del deliver way more value than anybody else. I have to challenge all those things, but we'll talk about yes. that later. Yes, looking forward. And our cap table, uh, I still own Hold 7%. On. So you're on the left side. You're looking at the left side. That's the current oh, screen. Yes. The right side hasn't come up yet. Cap table. Now, you guys see it? Yep. I still own 70%. The cool thing is every person in the company owns the equity. So we pay our team 80% in cash, 20% in equity. So I have pretty much about 85 partners in the business. And in their signature, they says co-owner as well. So Sharks, so take a shot of that too. Obviously, equity will be important in any negotiation here. So I want to show you what do we focus on. So what does this every business need? If you talk to every gym owner, every local business, they'll tell you, we need more customers, right? You guys need more customers. Every business needs more customers. Nathan needs more members in the conference and more members. Everybody needs it. And also you need to keep the customers longer. So instead of going traditional venue, let's advertise, let's pay for the acquisition, we reversed engineering and marketing. We start looking at how you as a customer is looking for the local gym, for the buying car stereo system. Number one choice is, you ask people for recommendation, 92%. And second choice is you look for other people opinion posted online. So that's where our focus starts. We boost your local business presence with online reviews 1,200%. So from organically getting one review a month to 12 reviews a month. That gives you a lot of traffic to your page. We put pop-up on, on a website that increased conversion 800% from 5% to 40%. All leads captured. So Andre, Plus, basically they're all widgets across the bottom of the screen here that you sell to SMBs. Correct. Right? Okay. And just for context, about how many SMBs are paying today? Uh, 1,300. 1,300. And ARPU of what? Uh, about $200 a month. A month. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And no like huge customer making up a massive amount of concentration? There are franchise chains, but they are still paid by individual locations. Okay. So we have rollouts, but they want to individual locations to pay for Okay, it. cool. So there's 100, 150 location chains. And we call the business in 60 seconds or less. That's why we get conversion, telling them that there is lead for them. Plus we extend their retention for 36% by implementing 10 different tools, from email marketing, text marketing, referral programs, landing pages, and many other things. So for a long time we were just bootstrapping, 
there's a small traction. We literally had like eight to ten thousand dollars a month revenue, and then we ran out of the money. When we ran out of the money, we changed the focus to go sales only. That's where we created a program for call center, 100% performance-based sales process, dialing 30,000 people a week. And we went from 150,000 to 1.15 million, going to 1.4. And then we figured out, now we are profitable. We have cash in, uh, in the hands. Let's restructure the company. Let's put a little process in place so we can prevent the churn, increase the quality of the product. So we took a year to restructure it and then continue growing again in 2019, but COVID hit. So we lost 35% in revenue, but we didn't lose the clients at that time. We did something very unique. And when clients came, call us to cancel it, we just told them, hey, use our application without limits. And um, they all stayed and they continue paying three months later. Andre, really quick, so in 2016, when you took the extra 90K investment, yes. do you remember that? How, what was the valuation? $3 million. Okay, in 2016, yep. so basically pre-revenue. Correct. Okay, and, and was that a friendly uh, sort of mom, dad, uncle, aunt? That brother? was a person I met at a conference. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sensing a, I'm sensing a pattern. <laughs> and he wrote on a napkin, would you like to take investment? I wish I had a picture of that napkin. But the last valuation from someone that's not you, so an outside party, was $3 million in 2016 for 90 k invested? No, we get after COVID another investment. Okay, what, yes. tell us about that. Yes, it was a half a million dollars investment between three investors. We sent an email to our client saying, do you want to own a piece of the referizer? And the same client who was asking to cancel and save $150 a month, right? Wrote me a check of $300,000. <laughs> Guess what, right? It happens. Rich uncles. That's right, and it was $9 million valuation at that time. Nine valuation. Yes. Okay, so, so, so again, everyone can do the math, multiple wise, right? So about a two million, two and a half million run rate. It was about a two million dollar run rate. We were finishing the year with 1.7 pretty much that okay. year. So four, four and a half X, exactly. something like that. Exactly. That feel high or low to you? Uh, low. Good answer. Okay. For you. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's right. <laughs> so uh, all of this is cool. We developed so many tools along the way, but nothing will happen, could happen, if I didn't have an incredible team. You, ha you see George O'Leary. He had four companies. Um, he take four companies public. Uh, incredible person, mentor, advisor, and my CFO. I have Lazar Jamic, who was head of the Google Zoo. Google Zoo is advertising agency owned by Google. He led this. They didn't take account unless it's $250 million in spend. Incredible. And I have other people from my previous venture accelerator uh, that join as investors and advisors. Uh, cool thing is we have 15 developers back in Serbia. C customer success team is in Serbia. We are literally having no overhead. Our team is 100% remote and salespeople are 100% commission based. Very unique approach. So. 1,300 paying customers now, we just exceeded that. We focus now on multi-location franchise gyms and, and um, med spas. Most of our clients are paying over $150, 67% is a SaaS. What we like to say is, Referizer Strengths are a strong team. We have incredible culture. Team, my employees are offered literally tw two times to four times more money to switch the companies. Microsoft's trying to steal them. They're just saying no. They own the equity, they see the future, they love what they're doing, right? We have zero overhead because everybody's working from home, and that was prior COVID, right? It was very unique prior COVID. Now it's kind of standard. So Andre, before we bring up the sharks, tell us what you're looking for today. What would be like the perfect deal? Sure, so we're raising $1 million for 5% of the company. And what does that mean? That's, that's, that's a secondary that's going into the company on balance that's sheet? That's going into the company on the balance sheet. You don't want any personal wealth or anything? I will take when we double the company again. Okay. Right. All right, cool. So that's the ask. So just say it one more Correct. time. So 5% for uh, $1 million. Cool. Do you want to take us through use of capital and then sure. we'll the sharks? Okay. So the slide says $2 million, full transparency. We are about, if not already, to launch crowdfunding campaign on Republic. And it's going to fund us $1 million from that campaign. And with the same terms that we're going on a public offering or crowdfunding offering, where non-credit investors can jump in for as low as 100 bucks, we'll be raising second million dollars. And uh, use of the funds are growth, growth, growth. So we're investing in the growth, focusing on multi-location, spa, med spas, fitness industry, and so on. And uh, 
altogether hiring more people in support and development. And one big portion of our growth after we reach $5 million in revenue will be product-led. So we already invested hiring four people in a UX, UI, totally redesigning. Today is our launch day of new Referizer 4.0. Congrats, I'm celebrating man. here by myself. <laughs> My team is already celebrating in Serbia. Yeah, that's assets. awesome. That's run of applause. That's so exciting. Awesome. Okay. So on that note, so here's what we're going to do. Number one, um, can we start the 25-minute clock? I have no idea what time it is, so that will keep me on track. This is your seat. Thank you. This is your seat right here. I'll put you in the power spot. Uh, I would if I could. <laughs> I can't. So you can just, you know, we'll make it work. So this is, you'll be your seat, Andre. I'll take the, the slide okay. over. Yep, clicker. All right. Now, we have to flip to the sharks. So obviously, very vulnerable position. We also want to optimize the opportunity for a deal to actually happen, which means you want to actually know what source of funds are on the person potentially providing the capital. So I've sort of vetted all of these folks you're about to meet. The source of capital is clear. Many of them have already bought SaaS companies. So the likelihood and the ability for them to actually do a deal if they like it is high, right? That, that, that makes it you know, significantly more interesting. So are you ready to meet the sharks? Like you guys get no claps, only the founder. No, they get claps, you have to get claps. All right, so Scott, we're gonna do you first. You can start working your way up to the stage. You guys, Scott Irwin uh, brings a bunch of experience to software investing. He was ten year, uh, ten year GP at Rembrandt, and you'll recognize that second bullet, many of the logos that he's been behind. He can talk a little bit more about that. He's now acquiring companies. So Scott, grab any mic that you want. Andre, very friendly now. We love that. And Scott, just talk a little bit about what kinds of deals um, you're looking for. Check, check. Um, any kind of SaaS is fair game for us. There's really no like hard and fast rules in terms of market or customer. Typically, it's three to 10 million of ARR. Um, from our perspective, rule of 40 growth is a good way to run the business. It's a good rubric. And at three million of ARR, you're usually able to get enough of a team, call it at least 35 employees, You know, ideally 50 or 60, to get a lot of throughput. And for us, the throughput is around experimentation on go-to-market as well as product development such that you're getting a lot of little incremental gains and a lot of what we've learned as investors predominantly in product-led growth software businesses is that capital efficiency comes from experimentation it comes from little gains that you can you know out execute a competitor or you know monetize in a different way or improve conversion rate in a modest amount and as you start to um, roll those on top of each other and do it over a long period of time, the capital efficiency can become extraordinary. And so a lot of what we you know, pride ourselves on is how do we engage with a portfolio company or a software company to unlock that kind of potential. And for that reason, three million tends to be the low end for us. And 10 million is kind of the high end, mostly because it's deal, deal size. size or ARR? Uh, this is ARR. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So now with Camber Ventures, Yes. Right, so that's how you're doing it. So talk a little bit about your source of funds at Camber. And then we're gonna introduce Pascal next, just to make sure she's on deck. Yeah, so I'm a basically a reformed venture capitalist. I spent the last 15 years as a partner at about six different venture funds. I did only software as a service investing. It's probably about 35 or 40 SaaS investments. All were less than three million in revenue when I got involved, and as little as zero. Um, bunch of failures, but also was fortunate to have Four go public, um, ones that sold to Oracle, Microsoft, Salesforce, Citrix, even SAP, and as well as like Vista and Francisco and Riverwood and Sumeru, these big private equity buyers. And I really, you know, intentionally left venture, and it was a pretty cushy job. And personally, there were two reasons. One was I felt like if I did it for another 10 years, I'd kind of be mailing it in and would just be going with the current in the river, right? Just going the direction that everyone else was going. And that's not really my personality. And the second was more about the failures. You know, the failures hit me pretty hard. And the wins, I didn't feel as much ownership in. I felt like I was a bystander. So Camber is totally different. We look for capital efficient software businesses. We're very operational. Our operating team today is 10. We build technologies and software that we know that your businesses can benefit from. It's mostly around data and data operations, and we have teams that can unlock the power of the data within the business. And we want to find companies where you want optionality, right? You want some money for growth. You want some money to be able to, you know, aim for an interesting and large exit. You know, maybe not a unicorn, but maybe it's 100 or 200 or 300 million. 
And once you start raising venture capital, those exits quickly come off the table. You've raised at that price and your investors won't let you sell or you've raised at prices higher than that and your investors won't let you sell. So our model is more around a partnership to drive to those exits, leveraging some of our operating experience, but also to drive to those exits with a much higher probability of outcome. And we can talk a little bit about who the buyers are, but that's changing a lot in software as well. Guys, there have it with Scott. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll see what happens here. I'm gonna make a quick change. Andre, you take the podium. We're gonna do four sharks, actually, I've just decided. So you take the podium. This is better for you. You wanna just make them beat each other up, right? <laughs> In a nice way. In a nice way. All right, you take the podium. Cool. All right, next shark very excited about. How many of you guys follow Guillaume and Lemless? Raise your hand. What? Come on. No, really? Okay, a couple people. Yeah, I mean, this is a really great bootstrap story. You guys should look up his YouTube channel. I'll just type Lemless to YouTube. 10 million bucks bootstrapped. You guys should know. I mean, people are being shy if you want to know Lemless. So you may have seen, uh, she's going to kill me. This is, it was great content, though. You may have seen him do a very public attempt at a secondary on his YouTube channel recently. Well, the lady that was behind that, her name is uh, Pascal. She's with Storm Ventures. Go, let's go ahead and welcome her to the stage. I'll get more bio. Pascal, come on up. <laughs> You can take that second seat there. And so um, Pascal, as you can see here, um, she offered, and Pascal, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it was a basically $30 million secondary, $10 million to each of the founders in Lemelist at $150 million post money valuation. You correct me. Um, I tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that was roughly that, yeah. Um, a bit of a big check for us. I mean, a bit of that was uh, also just to be public about it. So a little bit of a, of a show there uh, with that video, but um, I really wanted to get into the deal. The, the growth rate was insane and he's French, I'm French, you know. Uh, <laughs> that, that helps too. That's amazing. So you're now obviously a full-time GP, MD, but Storm Ventures. Yep. And, yep. and so are you guys doing more secondaries now, Storm, or are you traditional B2B SaaS VC? We're mostly BB uh, SaaS VC. We're we mostly so Storm Venture based in Menlo Park. Uh, we do mostly you know uh, seed and Series A B two B enterprise software, but eighty percent would I would say is SaaS. We write checks between one and six million, and it's it's pure institutional VC, meaning we're we're looking for um, five to ten percent ownership with a check size. So we're a little bit um, valuation sensitive. Uh, which has been tough in the past two years with the, the variations we've seen on the market. Uh, it's been quite insane. But we are focusing mostly on product market fit. So we're looking for companies that are like accelerating across a million in AR, which to us is a proxy that tells us that the company uh, has found something that's working, that um, there's a repeatable sales process, so same use case across the customer base that gives us a hint that um, the company can scale and, 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 and the, the cash we're going to put in the company is going to become new AR. So we're focusing on sales efficiency. Every dollar spent in sales and marketing should become a dollar in new AR. And we really help the CEO scale from like being 1% to a team where we see a lot of breakage. Once we start hiring sales reps, uh, you get frustrated. You're like, why can't that sales rep like, sell as well as I do? That's because you have the magic touch. So we spend a lot of time trying to think of structuring that sales team to make sure that the dollar invested in the business is actually efficient. And Pascal, fund size, last fundraise? We are currently raising, uh, I don't know if I can say, we're closing next week. Uh, but Ryan it's said be, you could share. Okay. Oh. No, no, I didn't know. <laughs> it's going to be is not recorded. Cl close to 200 million. I would have been uh, in big trouble. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Guys, so that's Pascal, and a little different flavor than Scott, but still sort of the same world. Let's meet our third founder now. This is a search fund strategy, sorry, third shark. Search fund strategy with Kevin Peterson. Kevin, work your way up to the stage. Take that third share. Uh, he's targeting, obviously, cash flowing B2B SaaS companies with valuations between 20 and 100 million bucks. Um, and he'll explain a little bit, let's try and keep it to 60 seconds, Kevin, what a search fund strategy means uh, and what kind of deal you're looking for. Go ahead. Okay, good. So uh, I've been in this space for about seven years and we're building a portfolio of cash flowing B2B SaaS. So uh, the deals that we look at typically are cash flowing at time, that, at time of acquisition and the founders have reached a point where they've kind of maxed out on uh, their growth and uh, bringing in an outside team can accelerate growth from there. So we're looking for those opportunities to accelerate growth beyond uh, where the founders have taken it. Um, so uh, we're vertical agnostic. Um, really, what makes a good deal for us is a, is a model that has good moat. You know, it's not easy to replicate, um, difficult for 
uh, dev teams in Serbia to wake up one morning and do a knockoff version for uh, you know a fraction of the of the price. Shots fired. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sorry. <laughs> red lights around the room. Come on, red lights. We're, yeah. no, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, in terms of the search fund model, what that means is that we have capital lined up, but uh, not necessarily placed yet. And uh, today we're still we're still closing on a deal by deal basis. So um, we have uh, VCs, PEs, and family offices uh, that have committed capital, um, but they're you know they don't write the check until a deal is in and we've gone through due diligence. Amazing. And then last shark I want to welcome to say is Akil Jabber. Akil, to work your way up. Akil is with Horizon Partners. Akil was a regular on the YouTube version of the show and always always brought it. Was always a great a great uh, a great partner up there. So Akil, tell us a little bit about what your strategy is and what your source of capital is at Horizon. Uh, so we look for B2B SaaS companies. Generally our uh, our thesis is we look for between one and five million in ARR. Uh, we really do like uh, be, uh, marketing tech, so this is a, seems to be like a really good fit. Seems like some overlap with what we're looking for. Um, growth, uh, you, you know, and, and we'd like at least break even. Um, so that's kind of something that uh, you know we're, we're generally looking at. So yeah, we're, we're, we do deals deal by deal basis, and we're we're about to raise our first fund. We actually got approached by a institutional investors, and we're looking to raise our, our first fund here that they asked us to 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 structure for them. Do you have money right now to do capital? If you like Andre, if we like it, we'll do a deal. How much money? We'll get there. Okay, in just a second. <laughs> I want to make sure. All right, so here's how this is going to work, okay? You guys are sort of taking over the show now. I'm just going to moderate, keep things moving along. So we've got five minutes. You can ask any questions about customers. We'll just do customers first, and then we'll get into P&L and then balance sheet. So we've got the customer slide up. Feel free to jump into ARPU, churn, net dollar retention, whatever you want. So anyone have a question uh, already on the shark side? Go ahead and fire away. Akil, go ahead. Um, how many of your customers are agencies versus you know small businesses? Do you have, do you have agencies in your pool? Good question. Uh, agencies, we have two agencies out of 1,300 customers. Our focus was never on the agencies because they, we have went directly B2B. It is a plan that we'll do it not this year, next year, when we develop white label to streamline all the way to the agencies. However, white label is contradictory to what we do because we have feature core partner up network, whereas LinkedIn for local businesses, where local businesses can finally recognize who's next by without knocking on the door and click to connect and start exchanging referrals. So it's like when you go in a business and you leave the business card from other business, but it's digital. So it's placed in your phone as you walk out of the business. So in order to really make our system effective, white label kills a lot of features that we do and agency wants white label. So for that reason, we kind of hold off of it. Good question, thank you. In the past quarter, how much of your revenue came from existing customer, meaning upsells, as opposed to revenue from new customers? Good question. So Nathan asked me a question that changed my business totally. I didn't have the answer. He asked similar questions like, if you stop selling, how much, how you will continue growing the business? And I was puzzled. And I was like, okay, I got to solve this problem. So after that, thank you for that, we created two products. One is Platinum Services, where we handheld clients and we ask five times more revenue instead of $200 a month, it's $1,000 a month. And they are buying it way more than I expected. Plus we added agency services to do lead generation for them and that went from four to eight to 16 to 32, now it's about $40,000 a month revenue. So we are adding additional services to the existing clients. How much is total number? I cannot tell you that out of the top of my mind, but our net revenue retention is increasing radically because of Pascal, that. when you hear agency revenue or services, what does that mean to you as a SaaS investor? Good or bad? It's scary. And yeah. why? It's scary because if um, a personal services just doesn't scale and Correct. the margins are terrible on it, uh, and, and it's a waste, you have to do personal services when you deal with a large enterprise. It's inevitable, but usually you do a pass through and you use a third party um, if you want to. But uh, agencies, it's like if you lose the agency, you can lose 50 customers associated with the agency. And that's the scary part is like the churn associated and the, the no direct contact with the final end user. So I applaud you for refusing agency customer because it's very tempting, but uh, it's also uh, could be a big problem from a churn and engagement uh, point of view. That's true. We experienced first couple challenges in the first couple months of agency until we streamline who we want to work with. And now we have great profit margin that is funding our new team that we are doing product-led approach. So our agency is our biggest investor now because we kind of keep it separate books for the agency. And so all to the be clear, all these coming. numbers that we're seeing on the screen, none of this is agency revenue? 
uh, those are combined revenue. They oh, no. are. Pre previous year was mostly SaaS. This year is adding re agency and platinum. Okay. Okay. Go. Scott, do you have a question on customers? Sure. The you mentioned gyms and salons is yes. kind of the ICP. Is there something about the product that's specific for gyms and salons? Correct. So when we look who can we serve the best, where we can deliver the most value, is the businesses that has the uh, highest frequency of visits by the individual customer. So you go to the gym three, five times a week, while you go you to might. the same restaurant. <laughs> Damn. Bring it on seven times a week. While you go to the same Nathan restaurant does. maybe once or two times a month. So frequency for me to interact with you, ask you for a referral, ask you for a review is much higher. And you don't feel uh, overloaded by the communication after you walk out of the business. It feels like a transactional message. So we develop, the, develop and deliver way more reviews, may, way more referrals, way better results for businesses there, membership, subscription, and high transaction, high frequency visits. So that's why gyms, number one, med spas, spas, massage places, number two, and then chiropractic, dental, uh, restaurants, number three, and then we'll go in other industries as well. So guys, let's now spend five minutes on, on uh, last year's data, right? So this is full year 2021 p &L. If you don't, if you can't see it, if you didn't take a picture on your phone, like pull out your phone and zoom <laughs> in. We know you're not on Twitter. Pull out your phone, zoom in if you should can. Should put the QR code out to download. Yeah, um, yeah, we should. So, is there any? First off, like 60 seconds. Anything you want to highlight about the PNL, and then we'll let these guys fire away. Sure. The, the reason why we are burning now 40,000 a month is because we decided to. We are expanding our investment into growth plus product development for product-led approach. We are developing our brand new marketplace for all the apps. So we don't want to be a solution that only offers 10 tools that we developed. We want to be marketplace for other solutions like HR, employee incentive systems, and other apps that's going to be part of the referizer ecosystem. So uh, owning a development community is one big push for us in the future. Also, we'll be um, building two more communities, and that is user community, and the third one will be business community that we already have. So that's investment that we're investing because of uh, healthy cash balance. But we were a bootstrap company for 10 years. Are you guys and able to see the p on breaking, your phones? Breaking it, even. Can you see it OK? Ah, yes, that's, that's helpful. Can you do on the side screen so the sharks can see? This, uh, I know they're like, Nathan, you didn't tell us you were going to do this. <laughs> All right, fire away. Any other questions from someone that can see the P&L? Go ahead, Akil, yeah. Um, so two questions. One on the marketing is, you know, where are you spending that money? Um, and second is around the sales commission. So it looks like it's almost 50% of your revenue. 37%. Is that right? So, okay. Yeah. Uh, and goes between 33 and 45, depends on how qu quickly we're growing. Consider this, we pay half of the set of fee to our closers and half of the set of fee to our appointment setters. So 100% of initial collected amount, that's $500, goes out to be paid as a commission. And that's our cost to acquire client. So we recover our cost to acquire client in the first month. And then ongoing, we pay 20% residual revenue. So that between 100% initial and 20% residual turns out to be 30, 37%. Ongoing, and now we're introducing cap at the end of the year, 12 months. They're stopping with residual, so that as increasing retention, that's going to be more money for us, and so on. And who are these partners? Those are our. Uh, we have our partners as well, who are reselling us like that. Those agencies, and we have our sales team, five salespeople okay. and 20 appointment setters, who are 100% commission based, no base pay. Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to know more about your sales process. So what I heard is that you're running a boiler room today. Yes. Smile and dial. And you are getting a, a positive result from that, so, so that's good. But my, what I'm curious to learn more about is uh, can you accelerate growth by having some highly skilled enterprise salespeople on your team? And does, does that exist today? Do, is there an enterprise sales opportunity here? Thank you for reading my mind. So uh, yes, we are running a boiler room. It's 30,000 calls every week. It's a high-intensity call center. It's not scalable. So what we change is now change approach towards multi-location, top-down top approach, where we get 8,000 brands. There are more than two locations. 377 of them are registered franchise locations with 10 and, and more. And we are already in negotiation with doing a trial for 20 accounts for F45. They have 4,500 locations. We're doing I Love Kickboxing, the 160 location, Restore Hyper Wellness, 150 with 1,500, 1500 licenses sold out. We are in, in probably about 35 top-down brands in a test phase. 
And that all happens in the last three months since we ch changed the focus to go after multi-location top-down approach. So buyers, and, just, for, just for context, zooming in, just to, in case you can't see on your phone, you can see here, under, oh, you could see under subcontractors, there's about 958,000 bucks last year spent on subcontractors, including marketing, sales, developers. Are the phone dialers also in that category? Yes. Okay, yeah. so about a million spent against total top line on subcontractors, yeah. including the dial, the smile and dial. Yep. And it's incredible. These smile and dial guys makes about 40 to $70 an hour. And when we try to put them on an hourly rate like everybody else, they went to make just hourly rate and their performance dropped down to 25% what they used to it. So we have to bring back everybody on performance based and make money as you go, right? No safety net. What does retention look like? Yeah, great question. Retention has incredible improvement in the last year and a half. Probably four years ago we were 12%, then went down to 8%, now we had 5%. We are aiming by the end of the year to be 3%. So that's 5% monthly churn, churn and contraction, including uh, upsell. Logo churn, not, not, not revenue churn, because What's now we have What's net retention? Upsell. Net revenue retention we're just uh, starting to measure, so I don't have that number to tell you now. Maybe 4%? Car, uh, about, yes, a little bit better than logger. Logo, and it's okay, Andre, if you don't know something, it's totally cool. You I'm going to be honest, with, I'm yeah, not yeah. going to guess because it's not a bad thing. If you guys later on do due diligence, yeah. like you told me that number, <laughs> I have recorded. Okay, any other questions? And, uh, on and the thing is, uh, with multi location franchise uh, uh, businesses, if you just they take that segment from our customer database, it's 3% churn. So that's why we're going only after those because they, they churn less. Is that the 67% that you show in terms of revenue, or is that a different segmentation of the customers? No, no, that's just based on revenue, how much they're paying. 67%, all of them are paying higher, yeah. higher tier. What's of the, the retention of that cohort or that segment of revenue? 3% is, is a churn when it comes to multiplication franchise businesses. Okay. And it's improving as we develop more corporate features. We are the only company that has that corporate HQ management where they can go in in one place and launch a campaign for 3,000 locations if they want with one click. So guys, they we're love that. We're, we're five minutes away from sort of getting to the process where like you guys can we'll say throughout evaluation, how are you thinking, et cetera. So um, we won't do a category. Let's just tell you, you guys ask whatever questions you want. Give me about anything. We'll go for a couple yeah. minutes. Uh, out of the 750K in income um, for Q4 2021, how much of that is recurring? You said total revenue in 2021? So, I, uh, so I'm trying to point, understand your, AR, your current AR, your current run rate. Current, current revenue is about $250,000. Is it recurring? And uh, recurring is, I'll tell you, 30000 of that is not recurring. It's considered one-time set of fee. So about 220000 is recurring. 220 per month. Per month. And this is the this is from the most updated monthly cohort Correct. you're looking at it here, January 2020, right? So there's there's 212,000 bucks in January of total revenue, of which 30k of that 212 is non-recurring. So about 170. No, no, no. What was it? 250 and 230,000. Uh, oh, so what yeah. we're looking at here then Correct. is this is 212,000 bucks of monthly yes. recurring revenue. Correct. Cool. There you go. So you have 30,000 dollars of setup fees each month. Correct. It's about 90 90 accounts paying us about. Three to five hundred dollars a month. When we sign up, we're signing up about ninety accounts every month. Uh, you had a slide on revenue. Um, it, it looked a little flat, and then it spikes in the last quarter. Yeah. Um, just trying to understand what changed and how sustainable it is. And I understand you talked about features maybe on the product, but just trying to overall like how can that growth sustain? We went through four stages of Refriser. First one was sell it then build it. And when we sell it first, people buy it, it was MVP version of that feature. It couldn't be used by client at all, it was us serving them and setting up an account for them. Really low and UX, true story, because we were bootstrapping heavily. Then second version was, let's give a backend access, and that grew us to a situation where we went to 1.4 million. But it was very bad experience, not a perfect compared to today's version. And that's where we says, okay, now we can hire more people. We can restructure the system. Let's stop selling it as aggressively as we did. Let's focus now on retention. Let's focus now on the product. Let's focus now on system process, SOPs, structure. I did not have any executives in the company, 50 employees and only me. It was like transparency, no hierarchy. Nobody knows who to delegate them to me. 
It was wild west. That's where we needed a year. And it, I went three months per each department to restructure, to put position, job description, and everything else. So, and we were cash positive, so I didn't have to rush. And then we, we 2019, we decided we'll grow. But that's where the COVID hit and give us a little glitch in that process. Does, does that answer your question? And what do you think ARR growth, what's your ARR target at the end of this year? We're targeting to be $6 million by the end of the year. And so last year's growth was 30% of ARR. Uh, this 49%, year is... from 1.7 to 2.6. Oh, I saw like 2.3 to 3. Okay, 2.3 was there last year, but 3 is this year. 2022, based, sorry. 2022, so for, for um, last quarter revenue. For January or something, right? Yeah, January. The last three months of $250,000. So I think you grew 30% last year. How much do you think you so grew? So we went from 1.7 million to 2.6. Go 1. off 7. his words, not my slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's basically saying that dip was slightly higher and 2021 was slightly higher. Yeah. Right. So that last data point you guys see of 3 million, that's 2020. That's this year. So yeah. that's the start of this. So that's ir irrelevant. So 1.5 to 2.3. Andre, what you're saying is 1.7 to 2. Yes, the real number 5. is 1.7. Slide is, is not showing the exact December 31st yeah. cutoff. Scott, does that change how you value the business if it's growing 30% versus 45%? 49, yeah. 49%? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and the goal is this year to go to $6 million, year after to go to 12, but being product-led. We have incredible activities lined up just to open up freemium. All the features will be for free with the with a upsell and, a, and converting freemiums to pay, a premium client. How many sales reps do you have? Five sales reps and about 20 appointment setters. How many hit quota? The thing is we do not set a quota. We're a different company. So we have, our quotas are, you got to close 30% of what I played for you. So closers, if they don't close 30%, they don't get next deal. And our appointment setters as well are working on a performance base. Quotas are almost mandatory forced minimum or setting expectations when you have a base that you need to justify paying them or they are not part of it. When you have 100% performance based, right, quota is limitations. These guys are sharks and they are going after, if I show you a couple recordings of how they sell, you'll be amazed, you'll try to steal those people. But how many of the five do close 30% of Every single one, otherwise they wouldn't be part of the, they close between 30 and 50%. And it's automatic. We put like we measure everybody's performance. We have charts. The moment they, they drop to 29, they stop getting leads. So they need, they need to go up the pipeline and close it, make it up, and go on. Uh, so so your CAC is your implementation fee or your setup fee? Um, what's it, what's your LTV? What does that look like? It's about three thousand dollars, three thirty two hundred. The implementation fee. I uh, know lifetime value is thirty two hundred. Uh, uh, implementation fee is uh, four hundred dollars average, between three and five hundred dollars. So customers are on books for approximately 15 months on average? Yes. How, there, how are we feeling? Okay, go ahead, Kevin, you got yeah, another one? Is there one? Uh, any kind of win back program or loyalty program uh, that would help with retention beyond 15 months? That's correct. We do not count, um, a lot of our clients comes and goes, right? And right. we kind of count them three times as a churn. All accountants comes up, Every year, they sign up for three months, they get out, right? Mm -hmm. When the businesses need more business, they'll come in. Because we keep their data, we keep their back end. They'll reactivate account for three months, pump up the business, and get out. I have clients who cancel because they get to too much results. I have chain, little yoga chain, five locations. They have 855 star reviews on Google. The flood of the business they're getting because of that is overwhelming. So they say, sorry, guys, but we are out. You're too good. So we don't want to give them more reviews than we are giving, giving them. I'm not competing to. So Andre, uh, here's what we're going to do. Go ahead and re so repeat your ask one more time so everyone sure. remembers. So what we're looking, guys, is to supplement our Republic campaign where we are raising $1 million for 5% of stake in our company. So, so one, on top of the Republic On top on of the, top of the $1 million campaign. that's going to, uh, that we are anticipating getting from Republic crowdfunding. Okay, so on that note, what we're gonna do, we're gonna give you guys some time, because I did not send this to them ahead of time because we wanted original reactions, which is very tough because not only can they barely read it. Uh, <laughs> Surprise for I mean, everybody. I guess that makes it tough, right? 
Uh, they're, they're not superhuman. So we're going to let you guys be quiet and just sort of do your thing, sort of think through what you'd value the business at. Um, you know, we'll get to the point where basically say, Akil, sort of are you in or out? And if so, what valuation would you feel comfortable with? We'll go down the line. While we're doing that. question? Yeah, you can also, as they fire questions at you, Andre, of course you can fire questions back sure. to them. Let's do that in a second, though, okay? Guys, this takes a lot of guts to do this. So root Andre on a little bit. Give him a round of applause. This is not easy. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, we're, while the Sharks are sort of thinking a little bit, I'm going to go around the room a little bit. So, again, $250,000 total revenue in January. So this is two months ago. People can calculate a run right there. Ben is the SaaS CFO. You're going to hear from him tomorrow in a presentation. You see a lot of these deals. We're with a lot of founders. What would you value this business at? Put me on the spot here, huh? Uh, <laughs> not expected. Of course, I'm a CFO, and uh, I don't know. The numbers are a little too fuzzy right now. You know, what's the real growth rate? What's the recurring revenue? What's NDR? Uh, you know, I noticed on the P&L, tech support down below gross margin, which I'll talk about tomorrow. You know, that affects gross margin. So, mm, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to, you know. <laughs> ben doesn't want to pick sides. Okay, that's great. Do you want to add, do you want to clarify anything about, he said it's felt fuzzy a little bit, it's not clear. Do you want to clear anything up? Uh, we are, one of the values in our company is transparency, right? So that's why I like working with him because he asks clear questions. And we're here to tell you guys everything you want to know as much as I know around around the, the questions you're, you're bringing up. So, um, that's cap table. But. And yeah, I was gonna say, so uh, just to be clear. You, the way that we set valuations, I can give you our math, is we compare with database of him, with the interview he did, with the companies oh that are doing a now Republic. I'm supposed to be the They're, unbiased host. You can't bring me into this. Compare with the uh, peers in the industry. There was a slide that says how much uh, active campaign and uh, customer IO did, and. Uh, other industries in the marketing automation, and they're all between 18 and 35x. We did conservatively six times multiplier. So just because we don't want to drag this process, we want to close it, move on, and focus on growth. Because believe it or not, raising money takes more, a lot of times, and I hate wasting time on certain things that they're not growth driven. So, so that's Andre, why we think we, be, we made fair before valuation. Before we go back into deal making mode, so there's a couple people on your cap table that own like five, six percent. So yes. do they, would they have the power to sort of like block any deal you potentially agree to today, or do you sort of have full decision making power full, with sixty six percent? Correct. Okay, yeah. great. Um, cool. Um, on that note, um, any other sort of last words before we sort of get into a live back and forth? No. Nope. Just like bring it on. Let's bring see what happens. I, I missed on the cap table. Is there a pool for employees? Yes. What's the percentage? Yes, 10% for Already? employees. It's a pool allocated. They take about 4% so far. So 6% right. left. Yes. And because I know all our employees are equity owners and they have vesting schedule five years or up to exit event. And your investor shareholders are all pretty recent. So I'm assuming none right. of them are potential sellers in a transaction. Nobody really talked about selling so far, so it would be discussion if he, if he asked them if they want to sell or not. Scott, what are you thinking? Well, it's a very small deal size for most everybody on the, the uh, podium here, so it's, that's the issue. Yeah. Is that a deal breaker issue for you? You said you sort of start at three million. He's just not getting up to three million. Does that mean sort of a, there's no way you could work something out there? Yes. Okay. All right. So, boom. Now Scott's off the stage. Well, Give I can Scott tell you around. what we would do. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I know the company, know the business. It's kind of on our radar. Um, I think we need to know net retention. Mm -hmm. I think there's a pretty good formula that's a, a good starting point for valuation. And this blogger named David Cummings, C U M M I N G S, writes about. Um, and I, I think it's a generally a pretty good rule of thumb. I don't think that the valuations of active campaign or MailChimp or something are relevant at this scale. His formula is growth rate times 1.5 times net dollar retention. So if this business is 100% growth and net retention, maybe it's 70% um, is what I would guess, maybe it's 75, and times 1.5 times 10 on the growth rate, um, you're getting to like, a 7x. Mm -hmm. um, I think that with a $200 a month ARPU, our benchmark for gross retention would be 
60 to 70% gross dollar retention and 90% net dollar retention. And I think this business will be below 90% net dollar retention. It's kind of notorious in local small business customer base that it's really difficult to maintain growth rate because churn is always a problem. And when you're using a pretty heavy direct sales process on the way in, you're convincing a lot of people to try something that they may not have ultimately decided that they wanted to buy. 100%. And so that's hard. So here's what we would do, you know, mid-year when you've got some adoption metrics on product-led growth and people are choosing the product because they found it, they've done some research, they've raised their hand through a trial and a self-service on-ramp that they're interested and there's some volume there. I think 500 trials a month would be very interesting, 1,000 would be super interesting. I don't think that all of your products are likely to have the same value to a customer and so most important to me is which product is the one that they care the most about and that they want to start with. I think it's great that you can upsell them other products that they may not be looking for in the future. If I were to guess, I don't think it's marketing automation. I think it's probably referrals. I mean, not referrals. I think it's probably reviews. You're 100%. And I think reviews is the most valuable to these companies. And you know, most people who have an experience that they want to write a review about are doing it two or three days later, and they're doing it because they're pissed off. So it's very hard to get happy customers to write a review because they forget about it and they go about their life. So integration with POS, integration with the gym check-in system, integration with mobile are really important to get capture review at a point where the customer is super happy. And that's something that a business called Podium did really well. And that business is whatever, a $3 billion business. And a buddy of mine and former CEO of one of my companies was CRO there. Um, so I got a little bit of the lessons from that. I think it's a very good market uh, review management for small businesses. I think starting in gyms and salons is just fine. Super interesting. It's good to have an ICP. It's good to know who you're targeting when you're doing outbound. Back to what would be interesting. So you're four to five million of ARR. You're in the, mi in the middle of 2022. You've got some visibility on six million. You know, net retention's hopefully close to 85%. And we see a path to get it to 90%. You're seeing some upsell. You're seeing some product-led. Um, you know that would be something we could pay six or seven times ARR for. You know our check size is probably more like ten to fifteen million dollars, and a component of that would be secondary. So finding the point in time where Andre doesn't want to sell anything today, but finding the point in time where he's like, okay, raise one round, get the primary that'll take us all the way to an interesting exit. Let's say the interesting exit is two hundred million dollars. Let's say that this capital partner is going to de-risk our path there. And Andre, as a founder, is going to take some portion of capital out of the business as a seller. Maybe a couple of these investors on the cap table will sell too because they'll say, hey, you know, I got a 5X and, and that's good enough for me. And Andre's asking us to make room for this new investor. That's kind of the range of, of what makes sense for us and what works for us. And you know, lead volume is very important to us. Net retention is super important to us. ARPA, year-over-year -year growth, is a really key metric for us. I think 20% is a really good starting point if you want to try to grow ARPA every year and set a goal of 20% growth, a lot of good things will follow. You can't just raise prices twice a year every year and, and get there. You know, Customers who pay more are more committed, they're more stuck in, they're using success and support, so they're actually you know, a real customer, not just a visitor. And ARPU is a really good indicator of that, and ARPU growth is a Correct. really good indicator of that. And thank you for saying that. Uh, similar situation happened in, a, in our, one of our chains. We Andre, real quick, real quick, sorry. Ahead. So Scott, sum that up in a yes. sentence. What would the offer be mid-year this year? So let's say it's seven times ARR, that's 30 or $35 million valuation. We're looking to write a $15 million check. Business isn't gonna need 10 million of primary we'll figure out what the right number is. Let's say it's five and we have a really prudent, responsible way to go and invest that and maintain growth and address some of the retention things. Um, I don't know that there's 10 million of secondary in a business like this at that price. Kind of yeah. all comes down to you, um, but that's rough numbers. Okay, thank you for that. Well, what do you mean, Andrew? What do you mean, thank you for that? How does that make you feel? <laughs> uh, nothing that I didn't expect. Uh, I appreciate appreciate the offer, Scott. Uh, me and Scott had conversations before, and this is coincident that that we met ag again here in person. Uh, w for us, this is just a bridge round to get us to the real round at this five to fifteen million dollars, where we really want to scale and take it to the next level with a, with a new process, new new product led approach. So uh, 
with or without investment, we are on the path to do that. It's going to just be f faster, easier preparation for the second round as we as we come up close. So and we're in the same line as the time approaches, and our revenue comes to the moment of four to six million dollars. Yeah, and yeah. we're interested now, and we're interested then. Um, I do think there's a little bit of premium for Andre, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm up here. I've heard his story. He referenced it, what he survived. His energy is incredible. You don't get it until you really sit down and talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. There's certain premium you pay for founder DNA that you just think's like, it hits you, it resonates with you. Um, he has that. Thank you. Pascal, what are you feeling? Um, so I think we, we, I don't think we're a good fit for the bridge, but we're a good fit for the following round, right? The, the one you're trying to get to. And yep. if, I think not just with Storm, but in general, if you're able to add a million in new AR per quarter, two quarters in a row, which is kind of yeah, even under your plan, right? Yep. Uh, you're in a good shape to raise with VC, uh, raising your Series A. And at this point, if you control your NR net, re net revenue retention, uh, if you get closer to 100%, if, I know it's going to be hard, but uh, if you can cross 100%, um, you can easily get a 20 to 30x of your ARR yeah. at that point. But remains to be proven that that basically you're proving the, the, the trajectory you're showing on your revenue slide is real, and yep. you're hitting it, and your your line of sight on six million at the end of the year is is real. Yeah, it makes sense. And literally today we have launches where I probably have data in my computer about analyzing net re revenue retention, but I don't have that number because it was today development rollout that give me that data. And I, Andre, let's push back a little bit here. Pascal, what would you, if you valued the company where it is today, what would you value it at? I would actually do, I mean, I would value it higher than what you, because you do 1 million for 5%, which is roughly 20, 21 million valuation. On Republic, uh, we're going with 18. So that's the valuation. On a 2.2 million in AR, that sounds low. Uh -huh. um, but I guess I would have to look at the churn and all, but. Sure. If the churn is too high, we, we just don't do the deal. That's that's a problem. But um, but if the churn is controlled, then then I think I would go a little higher. Uh, yeah. Sure. Kevin, what are you feeling? Yeah. So uh, it's not actually a match for our thesis. We typically buy controlling interest, and uh, we usually only get involved uh, once the business is cash flow positive. And typically, you know, we're really trying to set the floor at a million half minimum on cash flow. Um, and we typically trade on a, on a multiple of cash flow. Uh, growth is important in that, that you know, we can't add a premium on growth, but, uh, but the EBITDA has to be there in order for my team to start really digging in. Um, and I'll add one more thing to that too, which is, uh, you know, if this is something that we were to look at down the road, uh, I would be looking for an enterprise sales component that's important to me. Because uh, in my mind, this is B2B, but in my mind, in, in my experience, Selling to the SMBs that are salon owners and gym owners, it's a lot more like As a, business, a they don't B2C lock. sale. <laughs> and, you know, they, they churn because their credit cards don't get approved one month, right? Really? Um, and, yeah, nothing against them. You know, I'm, I'm all for uh, bootstrapping and capitalism in America. <laughs> but, uh, but it's hard for, for a, lot of these, uh, like a lot of these operators to um, support... Uh, add-on services like this in in hard times, and so it makes the sale more. It makes the sale a little bit less sticky, and uh, and the dynamic is a lot. In in my marketing experience, the dynamic is a lot more like a B two C relationship than a B two B relationship. So I'd really like to see an enterprise uh, sure. sales, peak, you know, piece in the in the organization. Andre, you want to like hit back or anything? No, I. I it's like a zoom, zoom in for deal, cash flow positive and, and uh, going with enterprise sales. We are going to enterprise sales. The, the problem with cash flow positive is we are investing and that's our mentality. Every dollar that comes in goes back into the business. And we always were, right? So I don't like paying taxes for profits and keeping it in-house. So that's why we have 85 employees for such a small revenue because we find a resource to hire and, and bring more value and de develop more. So I don't think we'll be focused to be cash flow positive Full transparency. Awesome, that's great. Kevin, thanks for the clarity, guys. Give Kevin a round of applause. You can exit the stage, Kevin. Leave your mic on the, on the thing. It's great.
All right, and then Akil, let's go over to you. So how, how, what are you thinking about? What do you like, what do you dislike? So I really like this business model. I think there's a lot of overlap, Andre, with uh, some of the businesses we have in our portfolio. So um, get shout out and Postalytics. I think we have you know, some overlap, so we can maybe chat offline over that sure. and how we can help you. Um, so there's, there's two reasons I think this probably isn't a good fit for us. One is uh, churn is a little bit higher. So we generally like you know, less than maybe 3%. It's probably like our, our higher upper limit. And uh, secondly is we look for at least you know, being break even, right? So you're, you're burning right now. So I think if you got to a point where you were at least break even, um, you know, I think everything else kind of seems to be a good fit. Uh, but I think you know Nathan kind of kills us with his valuation reports because we're we're a different uh, you know <laughs> type of animal. We we like doing full acquisition. So when people come to us, they're looking at those you know big valuations, 10, 20, 20x. We don't pay that like Pascal does. So uh, sure. if, if, um, I guess for learning for for what we would pay for this is probably you know at the growth you're doing right now. If you know take on full acquisition is probably around like 12 million and probably a bit of, a, of an earnout mm -hmm. on top of that. I think. Got so, it. Got it. Got yeah. it. So you, you have companies that are similar to us in your portfolio? Yes, there is some overlap, yeah. We, we have a marketing automation tools, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So from a founder perspective, when we are looking for investor, we're looking also for smart money, yeah. right? Uh, I believe money is everywhere. Money is in yeah. the customers and pockets and banks. It doesn't work without you putting work on it. So if we are about to choose investor, and I think we are privileged in position to... to accept the offer or choose the offer is people who are going to help with ideas, focus, interest, portfolio of the companies, similar, similar introductions that can take it off. So introduction to franchise chain or to, to certain associations or to companies that has a portfolio of the clients that can make partnership, something that can lift up their money even faster. So that's, that's the, I guess, Ask for it. Andre, are you there. calling Akil dumb money or are you asking him a question and saying, Akil, how can you help us? No, I'm asking like how much resources you guys have and how much you're contributing uh, I mean, to the, your portfolio companies. So we're, we're pretty hands money. on. Yeah, like we, we get involved and we'll, we'll start making, you know, transactions, make, make things happen pretty quickly. So, um, I mean, that, I mean, we, we can't match their, their capital and, and their valuations, but we'll help you grow. That's, that's, that's what we do. We get involved and we help, and we'll, we'll help you accelerate. Cool. Yeah. I mean, Andre, we're bearing the lead a little bit. I mean, you just offered you sure. basically a $12 million valuation. You own 67% of the business. You can do the math post-tax and all that put in your pocket. How does $12 million sound? Uh, sound okay, but I wouldn't take it as a, as a, as a part of valuation. So at least at this moment. Do you want to right. counter with something? This oh. goes in your pocket, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I, it's, it's, um, my initial goal was to build a company that I can retire. And when I get offered to sell a company to my body, I get that sense that now I can sell the business and continue lifestyle. Now my goal is to retire 100 people in the company. So I want all, every single one of employees to reach the financial freedom in five years. So until we That's reach fair. that, we're not selling it. So, so no. So what's the mat? Let's just before I go back, let's we'll circle back. Akil, it feels like there's like a little fire there. So so we'll le stay on stage. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> What's the max you'd sell to? Like, say you got the valuation under that you loved. What's the max amount of equity you'd sell today? A uh, million dollars, cash out. Percent. What's the max? Five percent. You? Oh, you don't want to sell more than five percent, no matter what. Let someone say. Are they you give talking you... about secondary round for my? No, just sell? let's say Pascal. I'm making this up, okay? But let's say a VC says we want to buy thirty percent. It's the valuation you like. Would you look at selling more equity at I the valuation? I would. I would look at to sell more equity if the partnership is right and and it can almost prevent me getting into the next round, right? If, if I see the value beside money coming in that can help me in certain things to scale faster through introduction, know-how, advices, or, or certain things that I'm not experienced. I'm $3 million, first-time founder, a lot, lot to learn, quite honestly. So if there's a way that can shortcut my process and speed it up, I'm willing to give more uh, equity than 5% than or 10%, including Republic. But it got to be reason for us to really put it on. Because what I learned, when we put more money, the more money is being wasted. Employees get greedy, everybody wants to raise, you start burning money without really getting in an efficient way. And um, we just want to make sure that we're utilizing all the resources to the maximum and full potential. All right, so let's go down the line here. Pascal, we'll start with you. Uh, you want to sort of offer some sort of deal here, valuation, or is this really not a fit for you right now in state? Why, if not? Uh, I think Right now, it's not a fit because before we do secondary, we just want to really have build a conviction that you're going to get there, right? Yeah. 
So we would, we would need a couple more quarters. But sure. then we're willing to do some primary, some secondary. Uh, we kind of like, we don't like to give too much secondary uh, part of the round, but we can, this is, it has become so much more negotiable in the past two, three years since COVID started. Um, so that's, we would be completely open to, if we were to like the deal, like the be okay with the churn and so on, we could potentially allocate some of the round to a secondary for, for you or the yeah. team. I understand. Um, awesome. But again, if you're on a number, so let's say like, Let's say you, in two quarters, you're at 4.2 million in AR. Yep. With a great line of sight, great pipeline that validates that you'll get to 6 million at the end of the year. So 1.3 million per quarter. Well, Perfect. anything above a million in AR per okay. quarter when the trend is controlled is, is, is exciting for an EVC. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and so at that point, you would be looking at a... I don't know what's going to happen with the market, sure. recession, no recession, but right now, you'd be looking at 20 to 30x your AR. Two quarters in a row above sure. a million AR. This yep. is the big if, yeah. So around December, we can talk. Yeah. Amazing specificity. Guys, give it up for Pascal. Pascal, thank you so much. You come on the stage. Um, Scott, you cheated. Actually, I didn't tell you guys who the buyer was. I didn't tell, the, I didn't tell Andre who the other sides were. So you guys have already chatted. I mean, was there a... Was there something that tried to happen previously and it just fell apart? No, it's just early conversations, yeah. you know, learning about the company. So where are you at, Scott? Is, is this something, do you want to, you know, you mentioned being interested a little bit later on, maybe a little bigger. Is there some sort of option uh, off, like that you might try and buy here? Or tell us more. What are you thinking? <laughs> I haven't figured that out. I think that, you know, there is a role for an investor who, you know, might want to get to a target ownership. Um, in your business, but is willing to get there in multiple transactions. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about because a lot of companies here are less than 10 million ARR and open to some liquidity and some primary, but maybe not open to a control transaction. And so I think that's still something we're working on. Um, a comment kind of unrelated that I wanted to just share with all of you is I think that retention is something that a lot of businesses that are small, particularly bootstrap businesses, will get dinged for in terms of valuation. And I think it's valid, but I don't think it's the, your retention today is not your retention in two years or in four years. And what you focus your money on today might be sales or it might be product. A lot of times it's product. It's typically not success. It's typically not putting a lot of resources behind you know, customer retention and customer upsell. And so I find that there's usually a lot of improvements that can be gained there, and that can show up directly in your valuation in the form of net dollar retention and net retention. I think it's arguably one of the, probably the second most important metric after growth rate in terms of valuation. So just because it's a certain point today and people don't like it, that's not the end game. And I'll also say every SaaS business that I've been involved with at one point, no joke, looked like really ugly and crappy on the inside, even maybe the day before it was sold. And SaaS has this great ability to, to demonstrate value on a spreadsheet that's pretty universally recognized. So an acquirer is going to view the value of your business totally different than you do as the insider who's realizing like, oh, we just lost our top customer and oh, it's so hard to get the next one and I can't hire anyone because they're all leaving and going to Google. That's not the end game, you know, like your, your business is worth more as you get bigger and as everything improves, it's all kind of a journey. I can tell you with a business I was involved with, um, Pipedrive, we, does everybody know Pipedrive yep. as a CRM solution? So, you know, that's 4% monthly gross churn. That's like 60% annual gross retention. That's, you know, by all measures, really poor. And that was always pretty poor. Net retention, you know, the day that we did, so I'll, I'll come to what we did in terms of liquidity. But net retention has always been less than 100% annualized and less than 100% a month, of course. And that was always considered pretty bad. And when I first invested, they charged six euros a month per seat per user or per user per month. And that was like $9 US at the time. It was kind of a joke for a SaaS business to charge $9 a seat. Like people didn't take it very seriously. And as you just grow and, and you learn and things improve gradually over time, you get to these revenue goals where you're no longer doubted. And then they start to become self-fulfilling. And then all of a sudden your phone's ringing off the hook because everybody wants to get involved with your business. And you roll all the way back. And you're like, I'm the same leader. I'm the same company. I'm the same management team that we were five years ago when everyone told us we didn't have anything that was interesting. And so we ended up selling 51% of Pipedrive 
for $1.5 billion to wow. Vista Equity when it had 60% gross dollar retention, which people would all say, oh, that's impossible. You've got to have 90%. Vista, smartest guys in the room, they'll never touch it. It's not true. Net dollar retention is more important. Capital efficiency and unit economics also matter. That business, in my involvement when I was on the board, grew from one and a half million of ARR to just over 100 when we did this transaction and only consumed $12 million of paid in capital. And that wasn't like a stated goal. Nobody was sitting around trying to figure out how to not spend money. We raised a lot more than that. It just sat on the balance sheet and, and provided no value. You know, we had over $100 million of cash when we sold the company. There was no value in it. We raised it. We couldn't spend it. So you can build businesses a lot of different ways. There's no upper limit on what they're worth. And just because retention is an issue today, that's not what it's necessarily going to be in two or three years. And so we as an investor, we're trying to solve the retention challenge, but we're not trying to penalize the retention for what it is today. And that's why I think Referizer is very interesting. Like they have all these other assets like low cost development, high product quality, you know, this interesting outbound model that almost never works when you have $2 million in revenue. That's super differentiated. Um, last thing I'll say is an is a advertisement for Nathan. I think there's a great turnout here today. This is my first event. I think in three years, this will be like five times bigger. I think that the audience of people yeah. that don't really buy into the venture as the only path or how much you raised as the true measure of your company's success is huge. And I don't think everyone really knows that these events are happening. And, you know, Saster is not about that. That's not interesting. That's, that's kind of like SAS 101, let's go cheer for VCs and tell them how great they are. That's not interesting. I think this will be a lot bigger, and I think that this audience Scott's getting me in trouble. is huge. <laughs> no, buy tickets now Hi, Jason. for next year. <laughs> I appreciate that, Scott. Guys, give Scott a round of applause with Camera Partners. Scott, you can jump off the stage as well. Andre, do you want to follow up on anything he shared related to No, sharing? I really want to uh, say thank you to uh, everybody on the Well, no, we're call. not done yet. Anything to, we're going to wrap up in a no, second, but anything uh, to Scott specifically? We have a pipeline coming up, for, so we'll be in conversation okay. with, the, with the Fox. In and the then, future. so what Akil is basically saying is $12 million today, but you, do you only do majority? Uh, normally, yes, yeah. Okay, so there wouldn't be an opportunity to do something that's less equity. He I just mean, say normally, so it's not 100%. Well, you're negotiating, I, not me, so you push. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm hearing is, you know, the money in, in your pocket isn't as important, and you're still excited, and you still want to grow the company, right? Hell so, yeah. So, I mean, I think I, we wouldn't be the best fit for right now in, in the way of investing in you, but I think there's other ways we can work together. Sure. Yeah. All right, guys, give Akilo a round of applause. Akilo, thank you.